Okay. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. And this is um, exciting to have today Dr. Winston Craig, Preventive Care Grand Rounds, to share with us um, uh, the expertise in um, complementary medicine, mostly herbals. So before we, we go, I would like to offer a prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us, be with the students, the faculty, and especially with Dr. Craig as he share his expertise in med medicinal herbs. We ask your presence. We thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, I will introduce the speaker, but um, as I told him, I don't know much about Dr. Uh, Craig. Uh, I know he is a professor um, at Andrews University for a few years or many years. And then I have a few students that, um, that took his classes and ended up uh, coming to Loma Linda. So this is exciting. And Dr. Craig also has been a professor, adjunct professor in the School of Allied Health and the School of Public Health in the last few years. So it's a privilege uh, for us to have you with us, Dr. Uh, Craig. And I will ask you to say a few words about, um, about you uh, complementing my introduction. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Santos. Um, yeah, I spent four decades teaching nutrition and giving lectures around the world, Latin America, Australia, Europe, many, many places. I don't know, I've lost count. Include herbs and nutrition and general health. So um, I'm always energized by students eager to learn. So I thank you for this opportunity. And um, it seems like I'm having trouble hearing. I'm having trouble with unstable internet. And my my screen has shut down uh, my secondary screen. So we're going to go ahead in faith and hope. No problem. So um, I just give one or two little introductions. The Bible, of course, uh, does include the use of herbs. And uh, King Hezekiah applied uh, a poultice of figs for medicinal value of power when he was ill in Gilead. Um, so both of these have reference to medicinal value of plant products. And then another example is uh, celebratory moments such as in the Passover they had um, bitter herbs that were to remind them of the bitter experience of slavery and then of course the, the last one that is mentioned are the culinary uses of herbs and spices that uh, the lush uh, irrigated gardens of Egypt grew um, various allium herbs that are mentioned here, garlic, onions and leeks, which were not grown uh, typically in the Middle East away from the irrigation from the Nile. So here we have in the Bible the setting of herbs having multiple uses, being very valuable for food and for medicinal value. So I begin um, with the question, um, what do all of the following have in common? Owning a dog, having a massage, watching a comedy movie, taking a walk in the park, and drinking some chamomile tea. Well, I maybe this is a rhetorical question, since hearing is um, difficult for me right now with the system I'm working, but I'm sure you all recognize that these all have therapeutic value um, in one way or another. There is science to document that all of these do have healing properties. 
And I, I want to just, this first lecture is an introduction to the whole use of herbs and to put it in the setting of complementary medicine, which is um, used as mentioned in the third paragraph there, together with conventional medicine. So these are add-ons or could be used in place of, but in many cases they're used alongside of. And it's generally associated with wellness on optimal living, whereas the typical conventional health system is more to do with removing disease and um, so complementary medicine, which involves herbal remedies, puts a, puts a greater emphasis on taking care of yourself, self-responsibility and the whole body. And so some have diagrammed it this way, complementary therapies at the left and conventional at the right. And I like to loosely think of this as whole person approach versus tissue targeted, you know, the knife and the pill um, that is common in conventional therapies, whereas the complementary uses herbs and nutrition and mind, body, spirit sort of approach. So it's they're not diametrically opposed. They're, they're focused in a different way. And I think we will see as we go along that in in cases we need both. Herbal medicines are usually self-administered. And so the question that comes to us is, when should we treat ourselves? Um, or when should we seek professional health care? Are we able to accurately diagnose a clinical condition? So here's a list. On the left, we have... Um, not such um, serious conditions, but they are, they are they can be chronic conditions. And on the right hand case, these are conditions that we would generally think of seeking conventional medicine, uh, breast cancer or cardiac problems, etc. So the question for the patient or the health professional who's conversant with herbal therapies is um, can we make the distinction from one or the other and there are issues to consider there is the cost the effectiveness side effects and dangers and all of these things need to be considered now if you think back in history um, the middle column represents drugs that are being used or have been used. Um, modifications of these may be present in the medical system. And what they used for is on the right hand side here. But the interesting part, of course, for us is that um, originally these were all a part of a plant, a leaf, a flower, the bark, a gum, whatever. So this does show the close connection between um, the two. In many cases, conventional drugs have been derived from herbal extracts. And how are these applied? Well, they're applied, the herbs can be used as a tea, where you take a plant, dry it, grind it, and then place it in boiling water usually steep it for 10 minutes because many of the components are not water soluble or it could be made into a powder or a tablet or in some cases taken as an aerosol. Um, and so in history, there's at least half a dozen uses that herbs and we'll be looking um, at many of these examples They can be used as ointments to apply externally or a potpourri, which can uh, fill the room with the smell of vanilla or lavender or some other, can definitely have an effect on the on the mind, on the attitude, on the relaxation, 
uh, and change the workplace. Aromatherapy oils also have a place. And then, of course, many of them are used in foods, hot beverages and medicinal value. And um, it was my privilege while I was teaching at Newbold um, in the summers of 2014 to 2018 to visit Chelsea Physic Garden, which is uh, almost 600 years old. And it's, uh, I think it's about four acres, 35,000 plants. And you go around and visit these. And the interesting thing for me was that this was the um, apothecary garden that was used by the local hospitals to grow plants that were used in as medicine. In other words, the pharmacy apothecary it was called in those days, the pharmacy had four acres where they grew the plants and prepared the medicines for the surgery and the treatment of patients. So it has herbal use has a long history. Of course, American Indians have used many different products. So uh, these have been passed on in, in tradition from one generation to the next. And even today, um, some of these are being used by Western society because of their value. Um, as Adventists, the uh, heritage of Ellen White gave to us during the 19th century the value of herbs. Um, she wrote that God caused to grow out of the ground herbs for the use of humankind. And if we understand the nature of these roots and herbs and make a right use of them, there would not be such a necessity of running to the doctor so frequently and people would be in much better health. <clears throat> so here the admonition is to learn what is the value in different parts of plants. And specifically in another place, um, she has recommended over the series of, what is it here, like uh, 12 pages, different herbal products, different teas to quieten people down or induce sleep, eucalyptus and honey for cough treatment. You can go to the drugstore today and you can get your eucalyptus and honey uh, cough treatment pills, medicinal value in the fragrance of evergreen trees. And I'm sure you all are aware of walking in such places creates relaxation, enjoyment. And there are many different herbs that grow in the field that can have various medicinal values. But today uh, we find this is just a dozen uh, or so of commonly used herbs that we will be discussing what they are, their value, and how to use them. Um, hopefully we don't <clears throat> find ourselves <clears throat> going in this situation where looking online for um, cholesterol reduction herbal products and, well, nothing recommends pizza or chocolate, so... I guess we'll have to go somewhere else. Today, the herbal market or botanical market has really taken off. Um, Europe was some decades ahead of the United States, but here we find people um, dissatisfied with, with uh, the healthcare system. It's a little impersonal very expensive. There are so many side effects with the drugs or radiation treatment or whatever. And people today are more interested in a green approach, a more natural lifestyle, and then having more responsibility for their health. <clears throat> and so the herbal approach is considered more gentle and having fewer side effects. So this is what is promoting it. And another reason is that, <clears throat> is that um, people go to the doctor and, and they're told, oh, yes, I recognize you've got 
these issues, high cholesterol and so forth. But uh, you're perfectly normal. This is what we're seeing everybody has. And the poor patient realizes they don't have the help they feel they need. And so they often turn to other things. This is a, a front cover of Time magazine um, 30 years ago. And you can see at that time they were promoting that herbal medicine was booming. One out of every three Americans using herbs. Uh, today it's like one in two spending billions of dollars. So it's definitely on the move. Now th these uh, numbers, I think they, they did this probably a decade ago, the numbers are way out of date, but the, the relative value gives you an idea of conventional drugs versus using a herbal product, which is the second for each one, uh, cholesterol reduction, sleep aid and prostate medication. And you can see the value of treatment is, you know, one quarter, one third, one fifth of what conventional drugs are. So this is another point that motivates people. Now, before we go on, I want to share with you what Dr. the late Dr. Varro Tyler proposed, what he called paraherbalism. It's a very important that we understand this because, and here he outlines 10, I've just taken seven um, for conserving our time, but he wants to make the distinction between real herbalism and what he calls paraherbalism or false or uh, misinterpreted. And, and this, this manifests itself in a number of ways. Number one, they teach that there's a conspiracy by the medical establishment that discourages the use of herbs, okay? This is not true herbalism. Herbalism recognizes, or people recognize that that herbs have therapeutic value, properly used, properly selected. But those who are in this false camp try to generate energy with this idea that there's a conspiracy. Number two, herbs cannot harm, only cure. Well, this is not true. There are some that can that are very dangerous, and I'll show you in a minute that some can actually kill you. So it's not true. You have to know what you're selecting. Number three, whole herbs are more effective than their isolated active constituents. Well, that's not true either. But um, the active constituents are not necessarily all over the plant. Sometimes they're located in one particular place. And then, then there's this false idea of the doctrine of signatures. And um, I've given you an example here. It, the doctrine is that light cures light, that what something looks like is the reason for its cure. So mental illnesses are cured by walnuts because walnut looks like a cerebrum, looks like a, a brain. Blood root with its red underground um, rhizome is useful for blood purification, eye bright for eye irritation. This, this is the theory that light cures light. And there's, there's no botanical scientific proof of this. So please don't run away and say Dr. Craig believes in this. No, I'm showing you that this is erroneous. Hepatica which grows in the woods in the east has a little leaf like a liver is used for liver disorders and ginseng which is pictured here um, it looks like a little person with arms and legs and so it can be used to treat the whole body everything okay so these, these this is false herbal thinking and these are some of the um, plants which are known to kill people um, when used in large doses or misused whatever. Um, here is one from my backyard in Michigan, pokeweed. 
they may be eaten in the spring, but when the fall, when they ripen, these little dark purple berries are poisonous and a number of deaths have been reported from people eating these. So continuing through this false or paraherbalism, natural and organic herbs are superior to synthetic drugs. That's, that's not necessarily true. Um, reducing the dose of a medicine increases its activity. Um, this is the basis of homeopathy, which goes in direct contrast to biochemistry, where um, the rate of an action depends on the on the quantity of material there. So this is just not supported by good science. And then number seven, anecdotal evidence is highly significant. Well, it's to be considered, but um, clinical trials are definitely better than listening to what one person said happened to them. So he, uh, Dr. Tyler, um, James Robbers and Vera Tyler in their book, Herbs of Choice, give these points in their early chapter and suggest that these have done so much to discredit the legitimate use of herbs. We need to be aware of these so that in defense of herbs, we can say that this is not what true herbalism is all about. Inaccurate information about herbs casts doubt on the therapeutic value of all the good uses. So. Okay, so this is the book that I pulled it from. There's a third edition out now that I was using the second edition. Another book by Offutt, Dr. Offutt, page six, um, in his book, Do You Believe in Magic? The Sense and Nonsense of Alternate Medicine. He makes the statement, there's no such thing as conventional or alternate or complementary or integrative or holistic medicine. There's medicine that works and medicine that doesn't work. I think that does it very well. And it's expressed in different ways, but there's only one true medicine and that's what works. And the best way to sort it out is by carefully evaluating scientific studies, not by visiting internet chat rooms reading magazine articles or talking to friends. So I guess this is his advice. Okay, so back 30 years ago, Harvard University, I'm sorry, I don't know why that happened that way, but Dr. Eisenberg at Harvard University did a national study to look at unconventional ways and what were people doing and of course, things have only intensified since then. But the trends, the picture is still the same. And he identified that the major unconventional therapies that were used were prayer, exercise, chiropractic therapy, massage, relaxation techniques, and herbal remedies. So herbal remedies is, is in this group of half a dozen um, natural or unconventional therapies. And they were commonly used for things that people don't often get good help for. Back problem, arthritis, allergies, insomnia, headaches, anxiety, depression, digestive problems. People with these issues are more likely to drift towards herbal treatments or other non-conventional or unconventional ways. And um, middle-aged, middle uh, Caucasian, um, well-educated people were identified as the ones that were most likely to use these, these methodologies. Looking at a little more recent data, but it again shows us, um, this shows us the, the data from um, the National Institute of Health, which I'll mention a little bit. You can see here 17% back pain, 6% neck pain, joint pain, and so on. So it's the same sort of list that we are familiar with earlier. And... Patients with cancer 
and uh, uh, diabetes particularly uh, documented as turning to alternate methods because uh, they feel there is some help which is not tapping into women with a breast cancer diagnosis and undergone chemo shows more, most frequently vitamins and minerals, herbs, antioxidants, and natural foods as, as therapy. So there are certain individuals that are inclined in that direction. And then um, this used to be called NCAM, the National Center for Alternate Medicine, Complementary Medicine. It's now called NCCIH, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, a little a little nicer sounding. This shows the products and you can see that natural products, the herbal ones are right here at the top. And um, this little cartoon I think is interesting. We've exhausted all the conventional measures. We have one last desperate option and that's to put you on an alternative medicine um, that has a 96% success rate. <laughs> that's quite sarcastic, but uh, it conveys a very important message that sometimes the alternate medicines, even though they're left to the very last, maybe <laughs> are the ones that actually work. Okay, what have we done here? I um, hit the wrong button, did I? Or... Okay, this shows the spread um, and the age spread. So you can see that while middle age is a little higher, all age groups actually, even infants and small children use these um, medications. Now, let's move with that broad background. Let's move into understanding what herbs are and, and um, where the active components are and what are the guidelines for using them. Very, very important to establish. The gold standard for understanding the safety and effectiveness of a herb or a drug is the RCT, the Randomized Controlled Trial or Controlled Clinical Trial, where bias has been eliminated and then these things have been published in peer-reviewed journals. Yes, many of these herbal products have been tested. I review um, journal articles and there are a number that are coming through. To establish the identity of a herb, you really need to know the Latin name uh, because there are a lot of lookalikes. Uh, you should only buy those products that have been standardized as containing X milligrams of a known phytochemical. Um, examples of this is that, um, packets that sell garlic pills will tell you this has four milligrams of allicin. Uh, this is a guarantee that they have a chemical lab which routinely is checking the activity, the biopotency of the compound. And another example is hypericin, which is the active compound in St. John's wort. So this is a safeguard for people who are, who are cautious and want to do what is best is to use products that have been standardized against a known active phytochemical. And we have to recognize that herbs, of course, come from plants and the level of that active compound varies, depends on the maturity of the plant, depends on the part of the plant you're using. You know, um, purple coneflower or echinacea has different varieties and not all the varieties have the same a purpuri, a longer folly, etc. They, you know, the activity may be in the root, may be in the leaf, may be in the flower. Some may have it, some may not. Depends where it's grown, where it's harvested, etc. So you have to recognize that there's variety, and so you can't be haphazard in just grabbing a plant and grinding it up and and ingesting it or making a tea from it and expecting a result. It may be 
nothing happens because you're not doing the right thing. The active principle is not a pure substance like aspirin. Hence, the herb does not have a consistent effect. The physiological effect cannot always be reliably produced. Obvious from the data that we just shared with you, the five bullets above will tell you that um, you buy a different brand and a different store or a different time of the year, et cetera, et cetera. You may not always get exactly what you expect. Now, a word about how the drugs and herbs are different. They, of course, both have active components, but in different levels. Herbs often contain additional active compounds <clears throat> that may be closely related chemically and therapeutically to the primary active compound. For example, the herb digitalis has 30 different glycosides. These are compounds with glucose attached. These all have cardiotonic properties, but they have different speeds of onset and different durations of effect. For example, digitoxin, one to four hours onset of action with a peak activity of eight to 14 hours. Digoxin, on the other hand, has a much quicker response and it peaks in just a few short hours. So with these multiple constituents, it provides a more uniform action. And if you were just to take the conventional drug. So in some cases, of course, this would provide a benefit or an advantage. But the disadvantage may be that you don't know exactly the ratio or the quantities that you're ingesting always. It may be listed on the package, it may not be. Herbs may also contain additional properties from the main active constituent. For example, in China bark has 25 related alkaloids. Quinine is one useful for treatment of malaria, and that's where we got the drug quinine from. It was observed that the bark of this tree was used by Africans that got protected from malaria. The bark also contains the alkaloid quinidine, which is a cardiac depressant, and kinchitanic acid, which can cause constipation. So these will be considered side effects when you're taking the bark rather than the purified quinine drug. So in this case, it could be a disadvantage to have the principle diluted by other things. So typically patients and physicians don't have good information about herbs, their safety or their effectiveness. Um, and there are not always randomized controlled trials in peer reviewed journals for all the herbs, some, but not all of them. So this information then gets passed on. But um, is it important to know? Certainly some herbs can negate and some can enhance the effect of a conventional drug. So it's important that doctors know this information, which herbs patients are taking, how much and how often. You know, if you go for surgery, they ask you, are you taking garlic? Um, they know that it's anti-clotting and other cases. So <clears throat> they don't always ask and patients don't always volunteer. <clears throat> Dr. Eisenberg, the study I mentioned 30 years ago that he did from Harvard nationwide, he asked people reasons why they didn't tell their doctor they were using herbs or other products. And this is what he found. Two thirds thought, not important, doctors don't need to know this. 60% they never asked. 30% is none of their business. 20% the doctor wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. 14% they thought 
that if I told the doctor, he would discourage the use of what I'm doing. And 2% even thought they may not even keep that doctor because you might think I'm wacky or not listening or in living in another world. So this is a problem. Drugs and herbs can interact, enhance, diminish the effects. And if nobody's talking, the patient to the doctor or the doctor to the patient, then things can go unchecked. And we wonder why things aren't working or, wow, this is a over-the-top reaction. Something's wrong. Most herbal medicines are technically unapproved drugs. This is important to recognize. While they've been used for centuries, and there's quite a bit of data about their safety and effectiveness, but it, it is lacking for the total picture. And unfortunately, um, that came about from Utah senators. Utah is a big herbal place use and production of herbs and so they got through congress or through the legislation so that fda doesn't regulate herbal medicines as drugs as in europe such as the commission e which is the german equivalency of the fda and they are um they are treated as dietary supplements and the FDA doesn't establish quality standards. This is where the problem comes in with herbs. They aren't properly regulated and it's the responsibility of the manufacturer to verify the safety. So safe, appropriate and effective self-care depends on how well educated the person is who's choosing it. They don't know what they're doing, then look out. And it also requires that the package be properly labeled in clear, understandable English so that people know what doses and how much to take and what the side effects might be and so forth. A pharmacist or the consumer themselves is often left to judge the quality and the safety of a herbal medicine used. Okay, now we want to mention um, that herbs are not to be used for everybody. And here are four bullets to explain four groups of people that should be careful, watch out. First of all, pregnant women. The drug can cross the placental barrier. Remember, herbs contain active phytochemicals that in many cases act like regular drugs, but only in smaller amount. Organogenesis occurs in the first trimester, so this is when the risk of teratogenic effects um, for the fetus is greatest. First 90 days, the woman should be very, very careful in what they're taking. Lactating woman is another one. The drug can be expressed in the milk. Preschool children that have a slower drug metabolism because of their immature enzyme systems um, also need to be very careful. And the elderly, because absorption, metabolism, and the elimination of drugs is different than it is in middle-aged people. And of course, the elderly are using a variety of drugs, perhaps, because of increasing chronic, chronic diseases. And then that brings up the issue of drug herb interactions and these are just three examples of interaction fever few which is used for migraines headaches um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug which if it's taken at the same time you can see that uh, one negates the effect garlic and ginkgo are anti-clotting um, factors, increased bleeding time, so taking warfarin can cause conflict. And then valerian and barbiturates. Um, valerian can accentuate the sedative effect of barbiturates. So these are just three examples of why 
people and doctors need to know what people are taking because they conflict or they enhance. So how do we choose correctly? First of all, use labelled bottles or boxes with herbs in them from well-known companies. Don't go by the price. Go by the quality of the name. Companies don't want to screw up and have to withdraw and have their name on the media because their product was found contaminated. And don't buy bulk herbs, which some stores have these plants in bins. Um, the people who put them in there don't necessarily label them correctly and don't exceed the recommended doses that are listed on the package. Buy only those that are standardised, as we mentioned earlier, showing that they contain X number of milligrams of active phytochemical. If something's not working, change the brand, and then there are some like Nature's Way that have been established as as useful. Um, so let's look at herbal teas, since they are commonly used. And I think um, some of this is repeating what we said earlier, but herb teas are not to be considered as cure-alls. Um, Whatever problem you have, run and make a herb tea. There's 30, 40, 50 different products out there marketed for X, Y, Z. It's, um, you know, some of them work, but you couldn't look upon them as the panacea. Be alert to their toxicities. While comfrey may be useful, for pain relief in a cream massage on a joint, it's not to be ingested internally as it has toxic alkaloids. So this is just one example. Avoid unlabeled bulk teas, purchased only those in packages with safe ingredients, pregnant women, young children, use caution, and drink at most one or two cups a day. So we should not think upon herbs as a substitute for taking care of the body. We still place herbal use within the um, lifestyle package of good diet, adequate sleep, regular exercise, good social relationships living a balanced lifestyle, these are all important. Herbs is just one corner of your life, not to be the dominant factor. So in conclusion, um, herbal medicine is complementary to Western medicine, um, has become widespread, maybe one in two Americans and billions of dollars are spent out of pocket because many much of this is not covered by plans. A variety of commonly used herbs may be useful for the treatment of various conditions or illnesses. And importantly to remember, while the discriminate use of some herbal products is safe, and some therapeutic benefits can be derived from their use, the indiscriminate or excessive use can be harmful, just like with anything else, sugar, salt, fat, a little bit discriminately used, it's fine, no problem, but excessive use of any one of those things can create a problem for your health. Alphonse, I think you've crossed the line from seasoning to herbal medicine. So we have to resist that temptation. So uh, herbal products, you can grow your own outdoors as these chives in my backyard, or you can 
you don't have a garden, you can grow things on the windowsill indoors, such as pictured here. These grow well, rosemary, basil, parsley, chives. You can buy them in the store or you can go get them in the marketplace. And you don't need a lot of space, windowsill or a few blocks at the back, a wheelbarrow parked in the right place. It's very easy to, to find a little bit of space. These, these don't take, it's not like growing a mango tree or an avocado tree or an apple tree, whatever. You can get good benefit. And of course, as you harvest the herb, and it continues to grow, replenishes itself. So any of you who are interested, I've written a couple of books on herbs. This one has 45 different herbs that are commonly used for treatment. So thank you. I'm not sure what time we were supposed to finish. I rushed through this thinking we had 50 minutes. I do have a few more slides. Um, after this, if we have more time, but I don't know what the framework is. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I just wanted to, to mention a little bit about um, the difference between herbs and spices. We will be talking. Some people think spices are only for eating and herbs are only for medicine or vice versa, whatever. But I, I want to do a little definition here and give some examples so that um, we can better understand the next two lectures. Um, herbs are classified as the fresh or dried leaves of aromatic plants. And any of you who grow these and crush the leaves, you can smell the thyme and the rosemary and the lavender have their own very unique smell because these compounds have terpenoids, which are simple organic compounds like you smell when you rub lemon rind on your hand and smell the limonene. Uh, it's also a, a terpene. It's the same sort of thing. These things are volatile, like gasoline. So once the plant is crushed and, um, yeah, the oil will tend to evaporate. So these should be stored in, in a tight, airtight container. And I, my recommendation is if you still have uh, in the case of culinary herbs, which many of them have therapeutic value, and we'll be talking about that next week. Um, these should be uh, thrown away after six months if you haven't used them because they lose their value. Of course, you may not want to waste the money, so you can continue using them, but the, the potency is diminished substantially after some months because not all of them, the spices are different, but many of the herbs, the properties are in the leaves. And so the leaves will give up this aroma after some time. Spices are the fragrant, aromatic or pungent edible plant substances, and they can be bark, buds, flowers, fruit, seeds, rhizomes and roots. And we can give examples of all of those. Um, they can be used for therapy, they can be used to flavor food, they can be used for medicinal value. So here are some examples. The herbs, basil, cilantro, dill, oregano, parsley, sage, thyme, the spices which are not leaves, uh, they are extracts, pepper, cumin, cloves, nutmeg, ginger, cinnamon, and turmeric. And as I mentioned, these different parts of the plant contain oils. And here we, I've given you examples of the different herbs and spices that are derived from 
uh, eight different parts of the plants, flower buds, I mean, clothes, that's what we're using. The leaves, which are used more in the cooking and given there, the bold or the rhizome, the, the allium family, the bark, cinnamon, etc. Now, just, just a, a quick word to conclude here, um, to distinguish or to, to put in perspective what Ellen White has said. She says that condiments are injurious in their nature. Mustard, pepper, spices, pickles and other things irritate the stomach and make the blood feverish and impure. And food should be prepared simply free from all condiments and spices. And you have to put this in the context of 19th century and try to understand what she means, because if you take this literally word by word, then it goes counter to a whole range of science. So I went through her writings and on the left here are things that are mentioned. Pepper, black pepper, ginger, cinnamon, mustard, cloves, and the number represents the number of times that it's mentioned. Spices are mentioned 60 times. And the X represents, she says, don't use it. The plus is an encouragement to use. And a question mark is the reading of the text doesn't give you her blessing or otherwise. So the only things that really are condemned are pepper and mustard and this general word spices, which we need to unpackage in two minutes. On the other hand, all these over on the right hand side um, aren't mentioned, so we can do as we please or read the science and make a judgment. It's important to put her writings in the context of the 19th century health reformers. And Catherine Beecher, which is she's pictured here, she wrote about the time that Ellen White wrote, that condiments stimulate the appetite in an unnatural degree. Pepper, mustard and spices are those most commonly used. These articles are inflammatory in their nature and stimulating to the nervous system. They had a, a big thing about unnatural stimulation of the nervous system during this time. So these these ones that she condemns are the same three that are mentioned here by Catherine Beecher, who history has described as the mother of home economics. Americans developed a great taste for condiment spices. Well, what, what are they? They are spices and sauces that heightened and sometimes transformed the flavors of foods and stimulate the appetite to an unnatural degree. Common offenders include mustard and the hot red peppers, as well as the imported black pepper. Okay, this is work done by Catherine Beecher, 1856. And so just taking one and looking at, see whether it stacks up with modern science, chili pepper is loaded with capsicin, and other similar compounds, very heavily loaded, which as we all know, creates a burning sensation, the mucous membranes, and it can aggravate duodenal ulcers and irritate the mucous membranes. Studies done by John Hopkins University 30 years ago showed that a high level of chili pepper consumption was associated with stomach cancer. Consumers of chili peppers had five and a half times greater risk of stomach cancer compared to non-users, a high level consumer, sometimes the risk was up to 17 times greater. So that was my little addendum just to show that there is a difference between herbs and spices and the comments that Ellen White makes are very limited to the hot inflammatory uh, peppers that are used, that all of the other ones uh, apparently are okay. The condiments which are condemned seem to be these sauces that were made from uh, intense pepper 
flavors to mask the off flavors of foods that people that lack refrigeration or whatever. So we should approach the next two lectures with relaxation that ginger and garlic and turmeric and all these other spices that we're going to promote for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, treatments, whatever, are not condemned by the leader of the Adventist church in the past. I think putting it in its context is appropriate. So this gives us our first lecture as to the place of herbal medicine in complementary medicine, its growth, its support, its um, value, the guidelines, who shouldn't use it, who can use it, who is using it, and keep in mind the difference between herbs and drugs. We can expect drugs to be stronger acting with more side effects, the herbs are more gentle with a less impact in terms of side effects and they cost less and they're popular, more increasing in popularity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Um, he was great and was a, a good background for us to understand the topic. And we have a few minutes for questions. If uh, anybody in the audience uh, has questions, I believe Dr. Craig is willing to, to answer those. Um, I have a question. No one else is speaking up yet. Hi, Dr. Craig. So um, one of the things that sometimes comes up in conversation is that in some cultures, historically, they have used um, hot pepper. Um, so I guess one question would be, have they noted an increase in the prevalence of stomach cancer in those populations? And is it possible that maybe there are some genetic or other differences that allow them to tolerate pepper more than other populations? A great question, and it bothers a lot of people. Um, so thank you for asking it. Um, the risk, of course, depends on the amount used and the frequency of use. So in Indian and Mexican cultures, I think where the studies have been done, they have shown the correlation. Um, it may be modified. Uh, maybe the risk is greatly diminished in um, places where it's just occasionally used and small amounts are used. In fact, in, in to counteract what I've said, in small amounts, um, there are phytochemicals there that actually protect against cancer. So this is not, you know, as a nutritionist, you would recognize that this is not um, an unusual situation where sometimes a small amount and a large amount may have the same effect or it may have a different effect. In the case of pepper, it seems that very small amounts seem to be health promoting. And of course, some cultures use it for elimination of worms, that would be positive. But I think the, the major point is that when it is used in large quantities and daily or very regularly is when the risk goes up. It may also be that the use the the um, using certain foods that like yogurt that may be buffer the sting of some of these things may also be helped. I don't think that's ever been looked at. But to answer your question um, broadly, I, I you know for example 
mainstream American culture that uses it uh, in restaurant foods and here and there it seems to be u ubiquitous. Um, whether that contributes to the risk of gastrointestinal cancer, I, I don't think it's ever been shown. Uh, it's only been shown where large amounts have been used. I don't know if that answers your question, gives you peace of mind or... Yes, definitely, because then now when I get that question, I kind of know how to address it a little bit better. Um, but yeah, that comes up because another thing too is that Ellen G. White was saying not to feed pepper to small children because it makes them <laughs> kind of behave badly. And then in some cultures, it's not uncommon for small kids to have these foods. So um, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's a question I've always had, but I just didn't investigate myself. So I just wanted to see your perspective on it. Thank you. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of foods that may make children a bit restless. So parents have to use discretion in observing children's behavior after what they eat.